If you open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we find the difference between those who are Christians, those who are in the light, those who are called by the light, and the rest of the world. And the contrast is clear. The difference is certain. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. And so I think you can see the idea, the subject matter behind these verses is clear. It's that the day of the Lord is coming, and it's going to come, and they're going to know right when it is, right? Well, not exactly. The day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. But if you note the middle of those verses, in the middle of this context, you know what separates the children of light from those who are in the darkness. Note verse 4. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. Verse 5 might clear it up. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. Now, not only are those who are of the dark associated with sleeping and drunkenness, but the difference is clear. The thief in the night comes when? In the night. Right? You heard me say the thief of the night, right? Seven people are awake this morning. But those who are in the light, they see, they know. But truthfully, what they do is they anticipate. They know the day of the Lord is coming. And we come to this concept of belief, and Adam preached an excellent lesson this morning on the fact that God can be pleased. And we know that there is one thing among a list you could make, but one encompassing factor that separates those who are pleasing to God and those who are not. And that is belief. That is faith. And if I were to ask this morning... Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Many of you this morning would say, absolutely, that's why I'm here and not on a boat fishing or at home sleeping or doing any number of things you could be doing. And so if I ask you, do you believe then that Jesus is coming again? The answer, again, would be certain in this particular group of people. Yes, He is. I have a question this morning. Are you ready? My last year when I was in college, around February, I want to get the dates right, February 24th through the 27th, based on when the audio went up, Kashka and I were able to hear some lessons on some of those nights from a man named Brother Marty Pickup. Marty Pickup was a good speaker. He preached well at the lessons we heard, and he did an excellent job. I was glad to hear him. We learned a lot. But just March 26th, of that year, depending on when you take it, about a month later, Marty Pickup, I believe in his mid-50s, died. I believe of a heart attack when he was playing tennis or at it around so doing. Marty Pickup didn't expect to die that day. At least the evidence seems so. And yet it happened. And I wonder... If we were to pick the end of our life and we could have anything etched on our tombstone, what would you want it to say about you? Well, if there's anything of any importance, you know what that answer is. That I was a Christian. That I am on the Lord's side. That as for me and for my house, we serve the Lord. But 
there are many things that we believe, and sometimes we actually don't believe them. Can I confess a few of those things to you? I don't think I'm alone. If I believe that Jesus is in our midst, and if Jesus was physically sitting right here, the King of kings and the Lord of lords was before us this very morning, that would be a wonderful event. Amen? But He is. Amen? How much straighter up would we sit in our seats if He was here? How much earlier would we have been here if He was here? How much would we have been paying attention if Jesus was here? I think it might make a big difference in some of us. I may focus more. I may sit up straighter. I may sing out louder. And you know what also might have happened? I might have focused more on the words of the song than any cares or worries of this life that too often distract me. But I want to go a little bit bigger picture with this. And I want to consider, do I believe that Jesus Christ is coming again? If I ask you, everyone in here would say, yes, I believe He's coming again. But I ask you, if you believe He can come any day, do you believe He's coming like a thief in the night? Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says He is, so you better. But if that's so... Would I have watched as much TV this past week as I did? Would I have surfed the internet as much this week as I did? What would my week look like if I was to devote my life to anticipating the coming of the Lord that I often read in the New Testament and will sign out loud to those who ask? Do I believe? Because if I do, it will change my behavior. Adam mentioned a story this morning about a tightrope walker from France, I believe. And there was a little bit more to, us, to the story, at least as I understand it. And I'd like to share that story with you now. I know many of you were not here this morning. So I'll kind of start from the beginning. There was a tightrope walker who did incredible aerial feats. All over Paris, he would tightrope across tremendously scary heights. And then, to, to build up anticipation... He would add aspects to it. First, he would go over blindfolded. If you can imagine, tightrope walking over these frighteningly high locations, blindfolded. But then that wasn't enough. Then he had to do it blindfolded, pushing a wheelbarrow. Can you imagine? Some people are weird, aren't they? But an American promoter read about this in the papers and wrote a letter to him saying, I don't believe you can do this, but I'm willing to make an offer to you if you will come and tightrope over the Niagara Falls. Well, sure enough, he did, and after that great sum of money was put down, the tightrope walker wrote back, Sir, although I have never been to America and seen the falls, I'd love to come. Well, after much promotion and setting the whole thing up, many people came to see the event. He was about to start on the Canadian side and cross over to the American side. Well, drums were rolling, and he comes across the rope, which is suspended over the treacherous part of the falls, blindfolded. And would you know it? He makes it easily. The crowds go wild, and he comes to the promoter and says, Well, sir, now do you believe I can do it? And the promoter says, Well, yes, of course I do. I just saw you do it. And he says, No, do you really believe that I can do it? He said, Well, of course I do. You just did it. And he said, No, no, no. Do you believe I can do it? Yes, said the promoter. I believe you can do it. Good, said the tightrope walker. Then get in the wheelbarrow. (laughs) 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is clear. The day of the Lord is coming like a thief in the night. If I were to ask, do you believe that the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night... You would say yes. But imagine if my response was, no, no, no. Are you willing to get in the wheelbarrow? Are your actions governed by your belief? We do this all the time in silly ways. Of course, you could apply it. I I believe that a hot stove will burn my hand so I don't place it there. If it's off, I will. And belief is truly going to seep down into my actions and control me. And that which separates those who are in the light from those who are in the dark are those who believe. And I have a question for you this morning. Do you believe? Look with me in John chapter 3. If you look with me at John chapter 3, you see a beautiful passage that is very well known. In John chapter 3, of course, I'm looking towards verse 16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Do you see the difference between those who have eternal life and those who don't are those who believe? Do we believe? Well, it seems like a simple and obvious question, but we know it can't simply be a mental acknowledgement. Surely, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who has gave such an ornate law to the Jews, and now has passed down the law and preserved it in the form of the inspired scripture in the New Testament, would not just simply seek for his followers to just mentally acknowledge that he is there and go living on as if he does not. Do you see how that line of reasoning falls apart pretty quickly? But, but then what does it mean? Well, we want true belief. We want that belief about the hot stove that says, it's hot, so I won't touch it. Or I believe the tightrope walker can do it, so I will get in the wheelbarrow. No matter the cost, no matter what the price. Because unlike the, some tightrope walker who can blindfoldingly go across the Niagara Falls, we know that God can do all things. So I want to make a list of some important things that we should believe this morning. I hope you have your Bibles out. We're going to look at some passage, passages rather quickly. The first thing that we should believe is that God is. There's a surprise, right? In Hebrews chapter 11, turn with me there. In Hebrews chapter 11, read with me beginning in verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen and was not made out of things that are visible. And verse 6, And without faith it is impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. And so you see, that's a pretty profound statement. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Do you know what assurance is? That I know it's there. You don't believe me? Read the last part of verse 1. The conviction of things not seen. You know what's easy to think about with Jesus being on his throne before us? Guess what's neat about that? Guess what strives us to sit up and sing out more? We see him so we know he's there. If I were to ask, do you believe? A fundamental aspect of that question is, do you know why you believe? If I were to ask you, do you believe that I exist? And you say, yes. I say, why? And after looking at me funny, you might say something like, I see you standing there. I hear you. At times, I've, shake, I've touched your hand. I know that you exist. Okay, that one's easy. What about George Washington? Do you believe that George Washington exists? Well, yes, of course. Why? Well, there's traces of him historically. You can track it and you can see his signature. And you can see monuments that detail what this man has done. But I can tell you something. You've never seen him. And there is a chance, isn't there, that it's all a hoax? There's at least a chance. I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying it's there. But we believe, even though we can't see. See, the tricky part about faith is that we're asked to essentially hop in a wheelbarrow, to live a life fantastically different from the rest of the world under the belief and trust and faith that God is and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Do you see that? That's what we're banking on. We don't need to put our trust in self, per Adam's point this morning. Our trust is 100% in the Lord. Amen? We might wake up a little bit yet. If you consider what it means to have faith, it means knowing, not thinking, not assuming, not just hoping that God exists, but knowing He's there. Knowing that if I do what He says, if I trust in the Lord, that His grace and His mercy is so strong that I can be saved because God desires that all men be saved. And if I will see, simply seek Him and do what He has said, that is trusting in the Lord. Of course, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, as cited in Hebrews chapter 11, implies that we understand that God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. You know what Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so that's a fundamental belief that we must have. Now, I want to look at a, a second fundamental belief. If you look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Again, I understand that many of us have these beliefs. But I want to question, is it mental acknowledgement or sincere faith? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 
Beginning in verse 16. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Do we believe that the scriptures are inspired by God? Because i got to tell you, it means a lot if it is. If the scriptures are inspired by God, what does that mean? That I can read the words of the Almighty God, who by His spoken word created all that I can see. That's amazing, isn't it? That is wonderful, but it carries with it a heavy responsibility, does it not? It means that those words are true. And when those words talk about following a certain path, obeying the one true and living God, submitting to and acknowledging a Lord of lords and King of kings, there is a high cost there. And what that means is our attitude, if we truly believe the Bible is inspired by God, is one that I will seek out what he has said and I will do it, and that's the end of the matter. There will be no quibbling There will be no sticking the Bible on a shelf or on the table where it doesn't move from its place. It will be, I want to know God. And I can do that by opening and reading His Word. God has blessed us so richly with that opportunity. And I have to wonder, when I leave my Bible on the shelf, when I don't read the Word of God, do I truly believe that's what it is? That is a remarkable thing to claim. And it's a remarkable blessing to have. Consider with me thirdly, and if you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to read several verses in this chapter. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we need to believe that Jesus died on the cross. I think Paul makes a good reference in verse 3 of things that are of first importance. But consider with me beginning in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want you to see these verses with me. So if you have an opportunity, take out the Bible from in front of you, type it in on your electronic device, whatever we need to do. Let's find ourselves in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Notice these things, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. That He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas then to the twelve. Do you see what's of first importance, what Paul passes on to us, what what he delivered, that Christ died for our sins. But with what? In accordance with the Scriptures. Doesn't that kind of underlie our faith that the Bible is inspired by God, fulfilled prophecy, that Jesus did die on the cross, that God keeps his word, that that should undermine in in a positive way, it should be a foundational element for our faith? Do we see that if we believe that God is, and that the Bible is inspired by God, we believe that Jesus died on the cross, but it's not just that. It's that Jesus was resurrected. Did you see that at the end of verse 4? That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And I don't think we talk enough about how fantastic this is. I want you to think for a moment with me about someone you know who has passed away. I want you to consider a loved one who meant a lot to you, who has passed on. I want you to think, what if just days after their death, they came back to life? What if they were in a tomb, and then they were walking and talking amongst us just like everybody else? That is a fantastic claim. Jesus died on the cross, and we remember that with the taking of the Lord's Supper. But what is truly unfathomable to our minds, and that I fear we sometimes give up in too much repetition without truly putting our minds to it, is that Jesus was dead, and then he was alive. Praise God that Jesus could be freed from the bonds of death and in so doing free us as well. Consider that that belief can open us to some serious ridicule. How would you feel about a friend who walked up to you and said they, had, they knew someone who died and two days later they were back alive? What would you believe? Well, they were never really dead, probably, if you were to you know, take that opinion. 
or you might think they're crazy, but the Bible says that Jesus was raised on the third day, and guess how? In accordance with the Scriptures. But keep reading with me in verse 6. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But note with me in verse 12. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is in vain. Verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are in your sins. You are still in your sins. Those are some heavy beliefs. You see how that's life-altering if we truly believe that? When I believe that I want a light on in my house, what I do is I go over to a switch that I believe, and when I turn it up, the light will turn on. Now, i got to tell you, sometimes that hasn't happened in my life, and it's quite disappointing. But it's on faith that we act. It's on belief that we do. And so, if I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that he willingly accepted the will of God, and in accordance with the scriptures, died, was buried, and was raised on the third day, can we acknowledge that that is life-altering to believe? That means I will be different, because there is no other God who can do that. There is no other God who created the heavens and the earth with just the spoken word. There is only the one true and living God, one Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, who died on the cross for my sins, and because of it, I owe him my life. And my life is a heavy sacrifice. It's easy to say, I owe him my life and keep on doing nothing. But can I tell you something that the scriptures don't teach us to believe? They never once say, don't be fanatical about religion. Don't get too, all too much into this Jesus stuff. You don't want to be too much of a servant. You don't want to be serving 24-7. That's not good. People don't like that. No, what does Jesus say? Pick up your cross and follow after me. That's rabid discipleship. That is radical. That is powerful. That is strong. That is life-changing discipleship. And we better be careful that we don't take too lax of a perspective. It says, you know what? I know Jesus is coming soon. I know he died on the cross for my sins and was resurrected. But he doesn't need me right now. This week, kicking back to me. Do you, see that, do you see that we can sometimes be a little shy of doing things all the time? We think, God surely doesn't expect me to commit my whole life 24-7 to service to Him. If you believe that, I would dare you to produce a scripture that says otherwise. Now, there are aspects of our life that are certainly enjoyable. Raising a family, being married, having friendship. Those are enjoyable things. But there is nothing that says we should ever leave our post of being lights into the world. And I want to ask one more question this morning. But do you truly believe? Do you truly believe that Jesus and judgment are coming? Because they are. How is the Lord going to come in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? Like a thief in the night. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Might just be a page over in your Bible, might be in the same opening. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, notice with me in verse 5. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. 
when He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Look back at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 now. Maybe now we'll understand what Paul is saying in verse 5. For you are all children of light of chapter 5, children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake. And be sober. What is the Christian call? To be awake, to be sober, to be awaiting the coming of the Lord. Do you believe that Jesus is coming again? Do I believe that I will be judged for my actions? Because if so, that, along with everything else, is truly life changing. I would often say I believe that Jesus and judgment are coming. You can't read the New Testament scriptures without understanding that. But I have to wonder, this past week, did I act because of that faith? Did I act in accordance with those beliefs? I'm not talking about just going to church. I'm not talking about just saying a night prayer. Did I act and fill out my schedule because of God or because it's what I wanted to do and threw in a little bit of God into my calendar? Where is our faith? Where is this belief that we all came to have? Can you imagine? I don't know how many people are here. I would estimate at least about 200. If 200 people went out and were on absolute fire for the Lord, Can you imagine the difference that we would make if everyone just did something in the kingdom of the Lord? If everyone did something every single day? Can you imagine the impact we would have? We'd have to build 10,000 buildings. And what a wonderful thing that would be. Consider with me, if Jesus were coming on Saturday, how would you plan your week? Would you say, well, Jesus is coming on Saturday, so I better get into Disney World. I've always wanted to do that. I've always wanted to do SeaWorld. I haven't gotten on that new Manta Ray ride. Jesus is coming. My time on earth is extinguished. I better get on that ride. I certainly hope not. What would we do? Yeah, we might do some physical things like gather our earthly family and spend time with them as much as possible. But can I tell you more so then than ever, any other time, what I might find myself doing is on my knees praying for mercy that the Lord will deliver me. You know what you might find me doing that I otherwise might not be doing? Knocking on doors, telling them that Jesus is coming, that their soul is in peril. And if not doing that, helping out my brothers and sisters in Christ who are in need of both wisdom and nourishment. Physical and spiritual. That is what a Christian does. A Christian picks up their cross and follows after Jesus. And I have to wonder, do I believe? If I knew Jesus were coming Saturday and this was the last Lord's Day, would I have found myself at church service and Bible class that last time? Would I have read my Bible more? Would I have prayed more? Would I have served others more in and out of the church? Would I have been more loving and kind to my spouse, my kids, and that random driver on the street who drives too slow? If I knew Jesus was coming Saturday, I might just turn out to be a Christian after all. What a sad statement that we live differently than what the Bible tells us will happen and what we too often claim to believe. It's easy to get beaten down. It's easy to allow repetition to distract us from the ultimate question, which is, are you ready? Am I ready for the Lord to come? Am I ready for the judgment to give an account of all the things that I said, did, and thought? I believe it's coming. I know it is because God has said so. Do my actions show my belief? Will we join the wheelbarrow of the Lord, trusting that He alone offers salvation, that God's grace and mercy alone is what can forgive us of our sins? Do I trust Him enough to obey? It's time to obey the Lord. 
And if I haven't been, if I realize that my life is incongruent with my beliefs, it's time to make that change. It's time to start serving God all out, all the time. Because that's what Jesus wants from me. If you are in need of forgiveness, if you've been harboring secret sin, if you realize that if Jesus were to come now, if this belief of that knowledge that you know is going to happen, and if you were to face your maker this day, how do you feel about how that encounter would go? Do you trust the Lord enough to come to him this very day, this very moment, giving aside all pride, all sin, and giving all glory to the one true and living God? If we can help you in any way, whether it's returning to the Lord, serving with your beliefs, or believing in God, that if you are baptized, you can have your sins forgiven and be found, being told to enter in, thy good and faithful servant, at that wonderful and glorious day that we as Christians can look forward to. Come forward now as we stand and as we sing the invitation song.